Join us for a thrilling podcast as we bring to life the casebook of Sherlock Holmes. This mystery story is sure to keep you on the edge of your seat and leave you craving more. Don't miss out on this classic tale from the casebook of Sherlock Holmes. We will follow Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson as they solve a variety of mysteries, from murder to kidnapping to espionage. We will see how Holmes uses his intelligence and deductive reasoning skills to uncover the truth behind these challenging cases. Join us on our journey with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in this podcast. The Casebook of Sherlock Holmes is a collection of short stories written between 1921 and 1927 and published as a book in 1927. It is the last collection of stories of the incredible detective Sherlock Holmes and his inseparable Dr. Watson. Through 12 other stories, as varied as an illustrious client and a Sussex vampire, a three-roofed house or problems of Thor's Bridge, readers will say goodbye to Sherlock Holmes through complicated cases that once again will test the brilliant mind of Holmes. The adventure of the illustrious client the adventure of the blanched soldier, the adventure of the Mazarin stone, the adventure of the three gables, the adventure of the Sussex vampire, the adventure of the three Garidebs, the problem of Thor Bridge, the adventure of the creeping man, the adventure of the lion's mane, the adventure of the veiled lodger, the adventure of Shoscombe Old Place, the adventure of the retired colourman. This podcast is perfect for fans of detective stories, history, and popular culture. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this podcast so that more people can enjoy it. Thank you for listening. Preface. I fear that Mr. Sherlock Holmes may become like one of those popular tenors who, having outlived their time, are still tempted to make repeated farewell bows to their indulgent audiences. This must cease and he must go the way of all flesh, material or imaginary. One likes to think that there is some fantastic limbo for the children of imagination, some strange, impossible place where the bows of fielding may still make love to the bells of Richardson, where Scott's hero still may strut, Dickens's delightful cockneys still raise a laugh, and Thackeray's worldlings continue to carry on their reprehensible careers. Perhaps in some humble corner of such a Valhalla, Sherlock and his Watson may for a time find a place, while some more astute sleuth with some even less astute comrade may fill the stage which they have vacated. His career has been a long one, though it is possible to exaggerate it. Decrepit gentlemen who approach me and declare that his adventures formed the reading of their boyhood do not meet the response from me which they seem to expect. One is not anxious to have one's personal dates handled so unkindly. As a matter of cold fact, Holmes made his debut in a study in Scarlet and in The Sign of Four, two small booklets which appeared between 1887 and 1889. It was in 1891 that A Scandal in Bohemia, the first of the long series of short stories, appeared in the Strand magazine. The public seemed appreciative and desirous of more so that from that date, 36 years ago, they have been produced in a broken series which now contains no fewer than 56 stories, republished in The Adventures, The Memoirs, The Return and His Last Bow. And there remain these 12 published during the last few years which are here produced under the title of The Casebook of Sherlock Holmes. He began his adventures in the very heart of the later Victorian era, carried it through the all-too-short reign of Edward, and has managed to hold his own little niche even in these feverish days. Thus it would be true to say that those who first read of him as young men have lived to see their own grown-up children following the same adventures in the same magazine. It is a striking example of the patience and loyalty of the British public. I had fully determined at the conclusion of the memoirs to bring Holmes to an end, as I felt that my literary energies should not be directed too much into one channel. That pale, clear-cut face and loose-limbed figure were taking up an undue share of my imagination. I did the deed, but fortunately no coroner had pronounced upon the remains. And so, after a long interval, it was not difficult for me to respond to the flattering demand and to explain my rash act away. 
I have never regretted it, for I have not in actual practice found that these lighter sketches have prevented me from exploring and finding my limitations in such varied branches of literature as history, poetry, historical novels, psychic research, and the drama. Had Holmes never existed, I could not have done more, though he may perhaps have stood a little in the way of the recognition of my more serious literary work. And so, reader, farewell to Sherlock Holmes. I thank you for your past constancy, and can but hope that some return has been made in the shape of that distraction from the worries of life and stimulating change of thought which can only be found in the fairy kingdom of romance. Arthur Conan Doyle The Adventure of the Sussex Vampire Holmes had read carefully a note which the last post had brought him. Then, with the dry chuckle which was his nearest approach to a laugh, he tossed it over to me. For a mixture of the modern and the medieval, of the practical and of the wildly fanciful, I think this is surely the limit, said he. What do you make of it, Watson? I read as follows. 46, Old Jury, November 19th, Re Vampires. Sir, our client, Mr. Robert Ferguson of Ferguson and Muirhead, tea brokers of Mincing Lane, has made some inquiry from us in a communication of even date concerning vampires. As our firm specialises entirely upon the assessment of machinery, the matter hardly comes within our purview, and we have therefore recommended Mr. Ferguson to call upon you and lay the matter before you. We have not forgotten your successful action in the case of Matilda Briggs. We are, sir, faithfully yours. Morrison, Morrison and Dodd, per EJC. Matilda Briggs was not the name of a young woman, Watson, said Holmes in a reminiscent voice. It was a ship which is associated with the giant rat of Sumatra, a story for which the world is not yet prepared. But what do we know about vampires? Does it come within our purview either? Anything is better than stagnation, but really we seem to have been switched onto a Grimm's fairy tale. Make a long arm, Watson, and see what V has to say. I leaned back and took down the great index volume to which he referred. Holmes balanced it on his knee and his eyes moved slowly and lovingly over the record of old cases, mixed with the accumulated information of a lifetime. Voyage of the Gloria Scott, he read. That was a bad business. I have some recollection that you made a record of it, Watson, though I was unable to congratulate you upon the result. Victor Lynch, the forger, venomous lizard or gila. Remarkable case, that. Victoria, the circus bell. Vanderbilt and the Yegman. Vipers, Vigor, the Hammersmith Wonder. Hello, hello, good old index, you can't beat it. Listen to this, Watson. Vampirism in Hungary, and again vampires in Transylvania. He turned over the pages with eagerness, but after a short intent perusal, he threw down the great book with a snarl of disappointment. Rubbish, Watson, rubbish! What have we to do with walking corpses who can only be held in their grave by stakes driven through their hearts? It's pure lunacy. But surely, said I, the vampire was not necessarily a dead man. A living person might have the habit. I have read, for example, of the old sucking the blood of the young in order to retain their youth. You are right, Watson. It mentions the legend in one of these references. But are we to give serious attention to such things? This agency stands flat-footed upon the ground and there it must remain. The world is big enough for us. No ghosts need apply. I fear that we cannot take Mr. Robert Ferguson very seriously. Possibly this note may be from him, and may throw some light upon what is worrying him. He took up a second letter, which had lain unnoticed upon the table whilst he had been absorbed with the first. This he began to read with a smile of amusement upon his face which gradually faded away into an expression of intense interest and concentration. When he had finished he sat for some little time lost in thought with the letter dangling from his fingers. Finally, with a start, he aroused himself from his reverie. Cheeseman's Lamberley. Where is Lamberley, Watson? It is in Sussex, south of Horsham. Not very far, eh? And Cheeseman's? I know that country, Holmes. It is full of old houses which are named after the men who built them centuries ago. You get Oddleys and Harveys and Carritons. The folk are forgotten, but their names live in their houses. Precisely said Holmes coldly. 
It was one of the peculiarities of his proud, self-contained nature that, though he docketed any fresh information very quickly and accurately in his brain, he seldom made any acknowledgement to the giver. I rather fancy we shall know a good deal more about Cheeseman's Lamberley before we are through. The letter is, as I had hoped, from Robert Ferguson. By the way, he claims acquaintance with you. With me, you had better read it. He handed the letter across. It was headed with the address quoted. Dear Mr. Holmes, it said. I have been recommended to you by my lawyers, but indeed the matter is so extraordinarily delicate that it is most difficult to discuss. It concerns a friend for whom I am acting. This gentleman married some five years ago a Peruvian lady, the daughter of a Peruvian merchant whom he had met in connection with the importation of nitrates. The lady was very beautiful, but the fact of her foreign birth and of her alien religion always caused a separation of interests and of feelings between husband and wife, so that after a time his love may have cooled towards her and he may have come to regard their union as a mistake. He felt there were sides of her character which he could never explore or understand. This was the more painful as she was as loving a wife as a man could have, to all appearance absolutely devoted. Now for the point which I will make more plain when we meet. Indeed, this note is merely to give you a general idea of the situation and to ascertain whether you would care to interest yourself in the matter. The lady began to show some curious traits quite alien to her ordinarily sweet and gentle disposition. The gentleman had been married twice and he had one son by the first wife. This boy was now 15, a very charming and affectionate youth, though unhappily injured through an accident in childhood. Twice the wife was caught in the act of assaulting this poor lad in the most unprovoked way. Once she struck him with a stick and left a great wheel on his arm. This was a small matter, however, compared with her conduct to her own child, a dear boy just under one year of age. On one occasion about a month ago, this child had been left by its nurse for a few minutes. A loud cry from the baby, as of pain, called the nurse back. As she ran into the room, she saw her employer, the lady, leaning over the baby and apparently biting his neck. There was a small wound in the neck from which a stream of blood had escaped. The nurse was so horrified that she wished to call the husband, but the lady implored her not to do so and actually gave her five pounds as a price for her silence. No explanation was ever given, and for the moment the matter was passed over. It left, however, a terrible impression upon the nurse's mind, and from that time she began to watch her mistress closely and to keep a closer guard upon the baby whom she tenderly loved. It seemed to her that even as she watched the mother, so the mother watched her, and that every time she was compelled to leave the baby alone, the mother was waiting to get at it. Day and night the nurse covered the child, and day and night the silent, watchful mother seemed to be lying in wait, as a wolf waits for a lamb. It must read most incredible to you, and yet I beg you to take it seriously, for a child's life and a man's sanity may depend upon it. At last there came one dreadful day when the facts could no longer be concealed from the husband. The nurse's nerve had given way. She could stand the strain no longer, and she made a clean breast of it all to the man. To him it seemed as wild a tale as it may now seem to you. He knew his wife to be a loving wife, and save for the assaults upon her stepson, a loving mother. Why then should she wound her own dear little baby? He told the nurse that she was dreaming, that her suspicions were those of a lunatic, and that such libels upon her mistress were not to be tolerated. Whilst they were talking, a sudden cry of pain was heard. Nurse and master rushed together to the nursery. Imagine his feelings, Mr. Holmes, as he saw his wife rise from a kneeling position beside the cot and saw blood upon the child's exposed neck and upon the sheet. With a cry of horror, he turned his wife's face to the light and saw blood all round her lips. It was she, she beyond all question, who had drunk the poor baby's blood. So the matter stands. She is now confined to her room. There has been no explanation. The husband is half demented. He knows, and I know, little of vampirism beyond the name. 
We had thought it was some wild tale of foreign parts. And yet, here in the very heart of the English Sussex, well, all this can be discussed with you in the morning. Will you see me? Will you use your great powers in aiding a distracted man? If so, kindly wire to Ferguson. Cheeseman's Lamberley and I will be at your rooms by ten o'clock. Yours faithfully, Robert Ferguson. P.S. I believe your friend Watson played rugby for Blackheath when I was three-quarter for Richmond. It is the only personal introduction which I can give. Of course I remember him, said I, as I laid down the letter. Big Bob Ferguson, the finest three-quarter Richmond ever had. He was always a good-natured chap. It's like him to be so concerned over a friend's case. Holmes looked at me thoughtfully and shook his head. I never get your limits, Watson, said he. There are unexplored possibilities about you. Take a wire down like a good fellow. We'll examine your case with pleasure. Your case? We must not let him think that this agency is a home for the weak-minded. Of course it is his case. Send him that wire and let the matter rest till morning. Promptly at ten o'clock next morning, Ferguson strode into our room. I had remembered him as a long, slab-sided man with loose limbs and a fine turn of speed, which had carried him round many an opposing back. There is surely nothing in life more painful than to meet the wreck of a fine athlete whom one has known in his prime. His great frame had fallen in, his flaxen hair was scanty and his shoulders were bowed. I fear that I roused corresponding emotions in him. Hello, Watson, said he, and his voice was still deep and hearty. You don't look quite the man you did when I threw you over the ropes into the crowd at the old deer park. I expect I have changed a bit also, but it's this last day or two that has aged me. I see by your telegram, Mr. Holmes, that it is no use my pretending to be anyone's deputy. It is simpler to deal direct, said Holmes. Of course it is, but you can imagine how difficult it is when you are speaking of the one woman whom you are bound to protect and help. What can I do? How am I to go to the police with such a story? And yet the kiddies have got to be protected. Is it madness, Mr. Holmes? Is it something in the blood? Have you any similar case in your experience? For God's sake, give me some advice, for I am at my wit's end. Very naturally, Mr. Ferguson. Now sit here and pull yourself together and give me a few clear answers. I can assure you that I am very far from being at my wit's end, and that I am confident we shall find some solution. First of all, tell me what steps you have taken. Is your wife still near the children? We had a dreadful scene. She is a most loving woman, Mr. Holmes. If ever a woman loved a man with all her heart and soul, she loves me. She was cut to the heart that I should have discovered this horrible, this incredible secret. She would not even speak. She gave no answer to my reproaches, save to gaze at me with a sort of wild, despairing look in her eyes. Then she rushed to her room and locked herself in. Since then she has refused to see me. She has a maid who was with her before her marriage, Dolores by name, a friend rather than a servant. She takes her food to her. Then the child is in no immediate danger? Mrs. Mason, the nurse, has sworn that she will not leave it night or day. I can absolutely trust her. I am more uneasy about poor little Jack, for, as I told you in my note, he has twice been assaulted by her. But never wounded? No, she struck him savagely. It is the more terrible as he is a poor little inoffensive cripple. Ferguson's gaunt features softened as he spoke of his boy. You would think that the dear lad's condition would soften anyone's heart. A fall in childhood and a twisted spine, Mr. Holmes, but the dearest, most loving heart within. Holmes had picked up the letter of yesterday and was reading it over. What other inmates are there in your house, Mr. Ferguson? Two servants who have not been long with us. One stable hand, Michael, who sleeps in the house. My wife, myself, my boy Jack, baby Dolores and Mrs. Mason. That is all. I gather that you did not know your wife well at the time of your marriage. I had only known her a few weeks. How long had this maid Dolores been with her? Some years. Then your wife's character would really be better known by Dolores than by you? Yes, you may say so. Holmes made a note. I fancy, said he, that I may be of more use at Lamberley than here. It is eminently a case for personal investigation. 
If the lady remains in her room, our presence could not annoy or inconvenience her. Of course, we would stay at the inn. Ferguson gave a gesture of relief. It is what I hoped, Mr. Holmes. There is an excellent train at two from Victoria, if you could come. Of course we could come. There is a lull at present. I can give you my undivided energies. Watson, of course, comes with us. But there are one or two points upon which I wish to be very sure before I start. This unhappy lady, as I understand it, has appeared to assault both the children, her own baby and your little son. That is so. But the assaults take different forms, do they not? She has beaten your son. Once with a stick, and once very savagely with her hands. Did she give no explanation why she struck him? None, save that she hated him. Again and again she said so. Well, that is not unknown among stepmothers. A posthumous jealousy, we will say. Is the lady jealous by nature? Yes, she is very jealous. Jealous with all the strength of her fiery, tropical love. But the boy... He is fifteen, I understand, and probably very developed in mind since his body has been circumscribed in action. Did he give you no explanation of these assaults? No, he declared there was no reason. Were they good friends at other times? No, there was never any love between them. Yet you say he is affectionate? Never in the world could there be so devoted a son. My life is his life. He is absorbed in what I say or do. Once again, Holmes made a note. For some time, he sat lost in thought. No doubt you and the boy were great comrades before this second marriage. You were thrown very close together, were you not? Very much so. And the boy, having so affectionate a nature, was devoted, no doubt, to the memory of his mother? Most devoted. He would certainly seem to be a most interesting lad. There is one other point about these assaults. Were the strange attacks upon the baby and the assaults upon your son at the same period? In the first case, it was so. It was as if some frenzy had seized her, and she had vented her rage upon both. In the second case, it was only Jack who suffered. Mrs. Mason had no complaint to make about the baby. That certainly complicates matters. I don't quite follow you, Mr. Holmes. Possibly not. One forms provisional theories and waits for time or fuller knowledge to explode them. A bad habit, Mr. Ferguson, but human nature is weak. I fear that your old friend here has given an exaggerated view of my scientific methods. However, I will only say at the present stage that your problem does not appear to me to be insoluble, and that you may expect to find us at Victoria at two o'clock. It was evening of a dull, foggy November day when, having left our bags at the Checkers, Lamberley, we drove through the Sussex clay of a long, winding lane, and finally reached the isolated and ancient farmhouse in which Ferguson dwelt. It was a large, straggling building, very old in the centre, very new at the wings, with towering Tudor chimneys and a lichen-spotted, high-pitched roof of Horsham slabs. The doorsteps were worn into curves, and the ancient tiles which lined the porch were marked with the rebus of a cheese and a man after the original builder. Within, the ceilings were corrugated with heavy oaken beams, and the uneven floors sagged into sharp curves. An odour of age and decay pervaded the whole crumbling building. There was one very large central room into which Ferguson led us. Here, in a huge old-fashioned fireplace with an iron screen behind it dated 1670, there blazed and spluttered a splendid log fire. The room, as I gazed round, was a most singular mixture of dates and of places. The half-panelled walls may well have belonged to the original yeoman farmer of the 17th century. They were ornamented, however, on the lower part by a line of well-chosen modern watercolours, while above, where yellow plaster took the place of oak, there was hung a fine collection of South American utensils and weapons, which had been brought, no doubt, by the Peruvian lady upstairs. Holmes rose with that quick curiosity which sprang from his eager mind and examined them with some care. He returned with his eyes full of thought. Hello, he cried, hello. A spaniel had lain in a basket in the corner. It came slowly forward towards its master, walking with difficulty. Its hind legs moved irregularly and its tail was on the ground. It licked Ferguson's hand. What is it, Mr. Holmes? 
The dog? What's the matter with it? That's what puzzled the vet. A sort of paralysis. Spinal meningitis, he thought. But it is passing. He'll be all right soon, won't you, Carlo? A shiver of assent passed through the drooping tail. The dog's mournful eyes passed from one of us to the other. He knew that we were discussing his case. Did it come on suddenly? In a single night? How long ago? It may have been four months ago. Very remarkable, very suggestive. What do you see in it, Mr. Holmes? A confirmation of what I had already thought. For God's sake, what do you think, Mr. Holmes? It may be a mere intellectual puzzle to you, but it is life and death to me. My wife a would-be murderer, my child in constant danger. Don't play with me, Mr. Holmes. It is too terribly serious. The big rugby three-quarter was trembling all over. Holmes put his hand soothingly upon his arm. I fear that there is pain for you, Mr. Ferguson, whatever the solution may be, said he. I would spare you all I can. I cannot say more for the instant, but before I leave this house, I hope I may have something definite. Please God you may. If you will excuse me, gentlemen, I will go up to my wife's room and see if there has been any change. He was away some minutes, during which Holmes resumed his examination of the curiosities upon the wall. When our host returned, it was clear from his downcast face that he had made no progress. He brought with him a tall, slim, brown-faced girl. The tea is ready, Dolores, said Ferguson. See that your mistress has everything she can wish. She vera ill, cried the girl, looking with indignant eyes at her master. She no ask for food, she vera ill, she need doctor. I frightened stay alone with her without doctor. Ferguson looked at me with a question in his eyes. I should be so glad if I could be of use. Would your mistress see Dr. Watson? I take him. I know ask leave. She needs doctor. Then I'll come with you at once. I followed the girl, who was quivering with strong emotion, up the staircase and down an ancient corridor. At the end was an iron-clamped and massive door. It struck me as I looked at it that if Ferguson tried to force his way to his wife, he would find it no easy matter. The girl drew a key from her pocket, and the heavy oaken planks creaked upon their old hinges. I passed in, and she swiftly followed, fastening the door behind her. On the bed, a woman was lying who was clearly in a high fever. She was only half conscious, but as I entered, she raised a pair of frightened but beautiful eyes and glared at me in apprehension. Seeing a stranger, she appeared to be relieved and sank back with a sigh upon the pillow. I stepped up to her with a few reassuring words, and she lay still while I took her pulse and temperature. Both were high, and yet my impression was that the condition was rather that of mental and nervous excitement than of any actual seizure. She lie like that one day, two day, I afraid she die, said the girl. The woman turned her flushed and handsome face towards me. Where is my husband? He is below and would wish to see you. I will not see him. I will not see him. Then she seemed to wander off into delirium. A fiend! A fiend! Oh, what shall I do with this devil? Can I help you in any way? No, no one can help. It is finished. All is destroyed. Do what I will, all is destroyed. The woman must have some strange delusion. I could not see honest Bob Ferguson in the character of fiend or devil. Madame, I said, your husband loves you dearly. He is deeply grieved at this happening. Again she turned on me those glorious eyes. He loves me. Yes, but do I not love him? Do I not love him even to sacrifice myself rather than break his dear heart? That is how I love him. And yet he could think of me, he could speak of me so. He is full of grief, but he cannot understand. No, he cannot understand, but he should trust. Will you not see him? I suggested. No, no, I cannot forget those terrible words nor the look upon his face. I will not see him. Go now. You can do nothing for me. Tell him only one thing. I want my child. I have a right to my child. That is the only message I can send him. She turned her face to the wall and would say no more. I returned to the room downstairs where Ferguson and Holmes still sat by the fire. 
Ferguson listened moodily to my account of the interview. How can I send her the child, he said. How do I know what strange impulse might come upon her? How can I ever forget how she rose from beside it with its blood upon her lips? He shuddered at the recollection. The child is safe with Mrs. Mason, and there he must remain. A smart maid, the only modern thing which we had seen in the house, had brought in some tea. As she was serving it, the door opened and a youth entered the room. He was a remarkable lad, pale-faced and fair-haired, with excitable light-blue eyes which blazed into a sudden flame of emotion and joy as they rested upon his father. He rushed forward and threw his arms round his neck with the abandon of a loving girl. Oh, Daddy, he cried, I did not know that you were due yet. I should have been here to meet you. Oh, I am so glad to see you. Ferguson gently disengaged himself from the embrace with some little show of embarrassment. Dear old chap, said he, patting the flaxen head with a very tender hand. I came early because my friends, Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson, have been persuaded to come down and spend an evening with us. Is that Mr. Holmes, the detective? Yes. The youth looked at us with a very penetrating and, as it seemed to me, unfriendly gaze. What about your other child, Mr. Ferguson? asked Holmes. Might we make the acquaintance of the baby? Ask Mrs. Mason to bring baby down, said Ferguson. The boy went off with a curious shambling gait which told my surgical eyes that he was suffering from a weak spine. Presently he returned and behind him came a tall, gaunt woman bearing in her arms a very beautiful child, dark-eyed, golden-haired, a wonderful mixture of the Saxon and the Latin. Ferguson was evidently devoted to it, for he took it into his arms and fondled it most tenderly. Fancy anyone having the heart to hurt him, he muttered as he glanced down at the small, angry red pucker upon the cherub throat. It was at this moment that I chanced to glance at Holmes and saw a most singular intentness in his expression. His face was as set as if it had been carved out of old ivory, and his eyes, which had glanced for a moment at father and child, were now fixed with eager curiosity upon something at the other side of the room. Following his gaze, I could only guess that he was looking out through the window at the melancholy, dripping garden. It is true that a shutter had half closed outside and obstructed the view, but nonetheless, it was certainly at the window that Holmes was fixing his concentrated attention. Then he smiled, and his eyes came back to the baby. On its chubby neck, there was this small, puckered mark. Without speaking, Holmes examined it with care. Finally, he shook one of the dimpled fists which waved in front of him. Goodbye, little man. You have made a strange start in life. Nurse, I should wish to have a word with you in private. He took her aside and spoke earnestly for a few minutes. I only heard the last words, which were, Your anxiety will soon, I hope, be set at rest. The woman, who seemed to be a sour, silent kind of creature, withdrew with the child. What is Mrs. Mason like? asked Holmes. Not very prepossessing externally, as you can see, but a heart of gold, and devoted to the child. Do you like her, Jack? Holmes turned suddenly upon the boy. His expressive mobile face shadowed over and he shook his head. Jackie has very strong likes and dislikes, said Ferguson, putting his arm round the boy. Luckily, I am one of his likes. The boy cooed and nestled his head upon his father's breast. Ferguson gently disengaged him. Run away, little Jackie, said he, and he watched his son with loving eyes until he disappeared. Now, Mr. Holmes, he continued when the boy was gone, I really feel that I have brought you on a fool's errand, for what can you possibly do, save give me your sympathy? It must be an exceedingly delicate and complex affair from your point of view. It is certainly delicate, said my friend with an amused smile, but I have not been struck up to now with its complexity. It has been a case for intellectual deduction, but when this original intellectual deduction is confirmed point by point by quite a number of independent incidents, then the subjective becomes objective, and we can say confidently that we have reached our goal. I had, in fact, reached it before we left Baker Street, and the rest has merely been observation and confirmation. Ferguson put his big hand to his furrowed forehead. For heaven's sake, Holmes, he said hoarsely, if you can see the truth in this matter, 
Do not keep me in suspense. How do I stand? What shall I do? I care nothing as to how you have found your facts so long as you have really got them. Certainly I owe you an explanation and you shall have it, but you will permit me to handle the matter in my own way. Is the lady capable of seeing us, Watson? She is ill, but she is quite rational. Very good. It is only in her presence that we can clear the matter up. Let us go up to her. She will not see me, cried Ferguson. Oh, yes, she will, said Holmes. He scribbled a few lines upon a sheet of paper. You at least have the entree, Watson. Will you have the goodness to give the lady this note? I ascended again and handed the note to Dolores, who cautiously opened the door. A minute later I heard a cry from within, a cry in which joy and surprise seemed to be blended. Dolores looked out. She will see them. She will leaston, said she. At my summons, Ferguson and Holmes came up. As we entered the room, Ferguson took a step or two towards his wife, who had raised herself in the bed, but she held out her hand to repulse him. He sank into an armchair while Holmes seated himself beside him. After bowing to the lady, who looked at him with wide-eyed amazement. I think we can dispense with Dolores, said Holmes. Oh, very well, madame. If you would rather she stayed, I can see no objection. Now, Mr. Ferguson, I am a busy man with many calls, and my methods have to be short and direct. The swiftest surgery is the least painful. Let me first say what will ease your mind. Your wife is a very good, a very loving, and a very ill-used woman. Ferguson sat up with a cry of joy. Prove that, Mr. Holmes, and I am your debtor forever. I will do so, but in doing so I must wound you deeply in another direction. I care nothing so long as you clear my wife. Everything on earth is insignificant compared to that. Let me tell you, then, the train of reasoning which passed through my mind in Baker Street. The idea of a vampire was to me absurd. Such things do not happen in criminal practice in England, and yet your observation was precise. You had seen the lady rise from beside the child's cot with the blood upon her lips. I did. Did it not occur to you that a bleeding wound may be sucked for some other purpose than to draw the blood from it? Was there not a queen in English history who sucked such a wound to draw poison from it? Poison. A South American household. My instinct felt the presence of those weapons upon the wall before my eyes ever saw them. It might have been other poison, but that was what occurred to me. When I saw that little empty quiver beside the small bird bow, it was just what I expected to see. If the child were pricked with one of those arrows dipped in curare or some other devilish drug, it would mean death if the venom were not sucked out. And the dog, if one were to use such a poison, would one not try it first in order to see that it had not lost its power? I did not foresee the dog, but at least I understood him, and he fitted into my reconstruction. Now do you understand? Your wife feared such an attack. She saw it made and saved the child's life, and yet she shrank from telling you all the truth, for she knew how you loved the boy, and feared lest it break your heart. Jackie, I watched him as you fondled the child just now. His face was clearly reflected in the glass of the window where the shutter formed a background. I saw such jealousy, such cruel hatred, as I have seldom seen in a human face. My Jackie, you have to face it, Mr. Ferguson. It is the more painful because it is a distorted love, a maniacal, exaggerated love for you, and possibly for his dead mother which has prompted his action. His very soul is consumed with hatred for this splendid child, whose health and beauty are a contrast to his own weakness. Good God, it is incredible. Have I spoken the truth, madam? The lady was sobbing with her face buried in the pillows. Now she turned to her husband. How could I tell you, Bob? I felt the blow it would be to you. It was better that I should wait, and that it should come from some other lips than mine. When this gentleman, who seems to have powers of magic, wrote that he knew all, I was glad. I think a year at sea would be my prescription for Master Jackie, said Holmes, rising from his chair. Only one thing is still clouded, madame. We can quite understand your attacks upon Master Jackie. There is a limit to a mother's patience. But how did you dare to leave the child these last two days? 
I had told Mrs. Mason. She knew. Exactly. So I imagined. Ferguson was standing by the bed, choking, his hands outstretched and quivering. This, I fancy, is the time for our exit, Watson, said Holmes in a whisper. If you will take one elbow of the too faithful Dolores, I will take the other. There now, he added as he closed the door behind him, I think we may leave them to settle the rest among themselves. I have only one further note of this case. It is the letter which Holmes wrote in final answer to that with which the narrative begins. It ran thus, Baker Street, November 21st, Re Vampires, Sir. Referring to your letter of the 19th, I beg to state that I have looked into the inquiry of your client, Mr. Robert Ferguson, of Ferguson and Muirhead, tea brokers, of Mincing Lane, and that the matter has been brought to a satisfactory conclusion. With thanks for your recommendation, I am, sir, faithfully yours, Sherlock Holmes.